My name is Erin and I'm the membership manager here at Brightheart. And I just want to take a moment to recognize all of you for being in this room right now and taking the time to really engage with us. I know it's not always the easiest thing to do. So thank you so much for being with us today and contributing to the Brightheart community. And I find that with any of these events, when we can kind of all come together and share this time discussing ideas and issues, um, it not only brings strength to us as individuals, but it brings all of us in this room, all of us in this space together and it strengthens our community. And that's why I am so excited for this first membership event. This is part of our civic circles. We're just so excited to get started with it. And I'm very excited to introduce Lisa Quickly as our guest speaker today. As a relatively young voter myself, I had to learn about voter suppression outside of formal education. It was something that you just find out exists kind of on your own through your either your own experiences or through people you know or reading articles online. So I am so excited that we have a public figure who is so passionate and strongly advocates for voting rights and making sure that everybody can make sure that their own vote counts. And Lee currently serves as Chief of Staff for Congressman Jim Cooper, who is a senior member of the House of Armed Services Oversight and Budget Committees. And for 30 years, she has worked for members of Congress from three states, including two members of the U.S. House leadership. And she has served on a number of boards and in advisory positions for organizations in Washington, D.C. and in Tennessee. And she's a frequent public speaker, particularly on women's leadership roles, voting rights, and the importance of access to health care for all Americans. So with all of that being said, Lisa, thank you so much for being here. We are so excited to share this time with you, and I will leave the rest to you. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, we need um, education and optimism, and Brightheart seems to bring that to everything you all do. So um, we'll get started. Um, Delisha, first slide. After the 2014 election, we knew we had a crisis. Tennessee is 50th in voter participation in the United States, ahead only of, only uh, ahead of Texas. Next slide. So the question was, well, is this a one-off? But it turns out, no, because in the next election, we were 48th in participation. In 2018, we were 44th. That's better, but we used to be in the 30s. Next slide. And a study at, the, at Northern Illinois University, which is oft quoted now, measured how easy it was to vote in states. And Tennessee has fallen the furthest, 10th easiest place to vote in 1996, and now third hardest place to vote um, in 2016. Next slide. The last decade has been devastating for voting rights in Tennessee and can be summarized um, in two ways. One, we have new laws that restrict the vote. And second, we have made no progress on common voting best practices and use of technology. Next slide. I just want to go over the political dynamic in Tennessee because this is important in terms of understanding um, how this structure has been put into place. The most important thing for you to know is that the Secretary of State in our state is not elected by the public. Tennessee is actually the only state in the union that only has three statewide elected officials. It's governor and it's two U.S. senators. Other states have lots of other elected officials, including a secretary of state, who then answers to the voters. Our secretary of state is not even appointed by the governor as a member of the governor's cabinet. Our secretary of state is appointed by the legislature. And the legislature is overwhelmingly Republican. And all 95 election commissions then in every state, in every county in Tennessee, are controlled by a Republican majority. Next slide. So here's just a graphic represent, representation about how um, difficult it is to vote in all the states. Next slide. So 
let's go over a few of the things in Tennessee that make this a really hard place um, to vote. One is we have a 30 day voter registration deadline. There's only a handful of states that have a 30 day voter registration deadline anymore. This might have been useful when we used to store files in file cabinets, but um, we know technology has taken care of that problem. The ACLU, um, Dale Ho, the ACLU's uh, voting rights um, expert <clears throat> calls repeal or even reduction of the time between registration and voting day is the most important thing Tennessee could uh, do to increase voter turnout. And the reason that this is suppressive is that most voters, probably not those of you who are on this call who are really interested in this subject, but most voters, so think about maybe somebody in your family or maybe a friend or someone at work that is kind of vaguely tuned in, um, they start paying attention to elections when the advertising begins. And that's usually within the 30 day threshold. So they suddenly get interested in an election and then they find out it's too late for them to register to vote. And people of course who arrive in our state within 30 days of an election, they're totally out of luck. Um, we now can register to vote online, which is a great um, step that was taken in September of 2017. Um, but this was very old technology that was suddenly new in Tennessee. Um, in some states, um, people had been registering online for decades. Next slide. We also have a really narrow definition um, when it comes to presenting photo ID. Some states don't require a photo ID at all. Um, the public in general um, likes the idea of having photo ID. Um, the problem is, is that the most common form of ID is a driver's license. Um, poor people, a lot of them do not have driver's licenses. Um, college students, a lot of them do not have driver's licenses. You can also use a passport, but only 28% of Tennesseans have passports. You can get a photo ID for voting purposes. Um, but you have to claim indigency and most of the workers at the DMV are not trained to understand what someone means when they come up and say, I'm, I'm too poor to get a driver's license. I would like an ID so I can vote. Um, college students cannot use their state university ID. So we apparently don't trust our state colleges and universities to provide an ID that can then be used to identify that person. But the faculty and the staff can. Um, but of course, if you have a handgun permit in our state, you can use that. Next slide, Delisha. I love that Delisha is shaking her head already. It's awesome. <laughs> um, this is my uh, slide that, you know, college students are basically just screwed. And we're now talking a little bit before in kind of in the way back days before COVID, because we'll get to COVID and absentee ballots in a minute. But think back to a time when we didn't have universal access to absentee ballots, which we will for the August election right now. But it was um, really hard for college students. Um, if they registered when they were in high school, for example, um, they couldn't vote absentee the first time um, when they went to college, they would have to either return to Tennessee and vote on the machines. Um, we had, um, because the law in Tennessee is that you have to vote on the machines the first time. And if you're out of town then, and you haven't voted on the machines, whether you're voting absentee or usually this is a class of people it really affects as college students. So we, in Cooper's office at least, we started registering high school students in their schools with the collect election commission personnel so that they could see their IDs. So when these kids went off to college, whether it was UT Knoxville or whether it was Stanford, they would be able to um, vote absentee the first time because they'd shown their IDs. Um, if you are a college student and um, there's, of course, maybe you're gone for four years, there's multiple elections over that time. In some states, you can just say, okay, now I wanna get an absentee ballot permanently or for the next four years. Um, but not in Tennessee, you have to request one every single time. Also, if you wanted, if you were worried about your ballot coming to your dorm, which is a concern, um, you uh, might say, well, I'd just rather have my absentee ballot sent to my parents' house and then they'll make sure I get my ballot. Um, nope, not allowed to receive your absentee ballot at your registration address. If you're a college student, it must be received at your college absentee address. 
Um, you also must have an ID from the state of Tennessee. So if you're a college student in Tennessee and you want to start voting in Tennessee, you first have to get a Tennessee uh, ID in order to be able to show that you um, are a resident of Tennessee. Um, here's, a, here's one that just absolutely drives me crazy, and it's going to be very relevant um, this election season, is ballots cannot be dropped off in person. Um, so we're having delays right now with the U.S. Uh, Postal Service for getting absentee ballots out to people. Um, they're not going to be able to drop them off. You must use USPS or the overnight mail. Um, you can get an absentee ballot if you haven't voted on the machines before, but it is rarely a part of the ins uh, instruction you'll see in a county election commission website. I've only found it on Williamson County's website, which is that you can go to the election commission and you can show your ID, which we every year send countless students to go do that, um, who call and they're worried that they're not gonna be able to vote once they go to college. Um, there's also uh, a loophole where if your college campus has an ROTC office, you might be able to vote there. That's also not listed on the Secretary of State's website. Um, and then for college students in Tennessee, we have um, over 10 uh, uh, colleges and universities in, in our city, tens of thousands of college students, and there's not a single early voting location on any or near um, any um, university. The closest you can get is Lipscomb uh, students could walk to the Green Hills Library, but for the most part, the average walk time to an early voting site is about an hour and a half if you didn't have transportation. And it's not just me, next slide, Delisha, thank you. It's not just me who's noticed this, it is the New York Times um, had a story in October of last year talking about the increased voter suppression of college students and uh, Texas and, and Tennessee are among the worst. Next slide. Um, the uh, mo motor voter law, when you get your driver's license and they ask you, would you like to register to vote? Um, if, you, if you mark yes, then you might think that that information that you've just given the DMV has been electronically transferred to the Secretary of State so that you can do one-stop shopping. Great, I'm registered to vote. No, if you mark that you want to register to vote, they will send you a paper application several weeks later in the mail that you can fill out and send in, which is silly because the state already has all the information they would need. Um, and there's no transfer of information of 16 year olds when they turn 18, for example. You know when 16 year olds are going to turn 18, um, they could automatically be registered, but, and they are in many states, but not ours. Next slide. Uh, so prior to COVID, we had no excuse. Um, we had no, no excuse absentee ballot law. So um, in the era of COVID, um, a lot of the laws have changed in the state taking into account that people are nervous being in large crowds. So um, it looks like 90% of Americans are gonna be able to vote absentee if they wish in November. Um, and so far there's five states that still don't know, including Tennessee. There are uh, two courts, uh, Tennessee State Supreme Court and US um, Federal District Court that are involved in uh, determining whether or not we're gonna be able to vote absentee in November. Um, but prior to that, the rules in Tennessee where, where you could not get an absentee ballot um, delivered to your home in Tennessee unless you were over 60 um, or if you were um, sick. And uh, those under 60 would have to have a doctor's note. Um, and if a doctor falsely signed a note to allow someone to get an absentee ballot at their home and they weren't too sick to go to the polls, they could be charged with a felony. There are long lines expected in November. Um, really worried about that. Judge Lyle um, has made a decision that it allows us to absentee vote in the election that we're in right now in August. Um, we'll see about November. Next slide. So we don't really have tracking of our absentee ballots in our state. Um, in some states, they can track their absentee ballots like an Amazon package. I ordered it, they sent it to me, here's where it is. Oh gosh, it's on its way. It arrived at my house, I sent it back. They have scanning capabilities that allow you to see every step of the way, 
In our state, we cannot do that. Um, we can only see when the ballot was issued and then when it was received. Um, the most important thing in many states that track their ballots is they'll let you know if your ballot was actually counted. And ours does not have that ability either. Next slide. Um, the only relative advantage we really have in Tennessee um, is early vote. We have, just think of it, we actually have 15 days of election day. Every day is election day. Right now it's election day for the August 6th election. But we tend to sort of treat it like this, you know, quaint little convenience, but it's actually the main event. And especially in the era of COVID, we have got to be driving people to vote early. I'll talk more about this later. Next slide. So um, there are new developments. Um, they're fast moving. So you might say, wow, I didn't know that. Don't worry. Some of these things have happened just in the last few weeks. Next slide. The most important of which is Judge Lyle said that absentee voting uh, must be made available to all Tennessee residents. Um, we are in the middle of early vote right now. Um, just to give you a perspective, in typical August elections, there are in Davidson County, 600 absentee ballots that are received during the entire election. Um, last Saturday, when early vote started, all of the absentee ballots that have been received to date in Davidson County were turned over for counting at the election commission and there were 10,000. And that was on the very first day of early vote. Next slide. But our attorney general has actually filed an appeal to stop absentee balloting even during COVID. Our secretary of state um, is fighting this every step of the way. Uh, next slide. In fact, the Secretary of State was so loath to carry out the judge's wishes that um, the information failed to show up on the um, County Election Commission's websites. Um, there, was, there was no information on about a third of the county's websites. And of course, 12 of those counties in our state, they don't even have a web page about election stuff. So it's hard to get the information out. The judge actually um, chastised the Secretary of State, um, said shame on you, and threatened criminal penalties if um, they didn't make some changes. And so the information is now available to all the voters, although those 12 counties still don't have websites. Next slide. Um, absentee voting is a very good option, um, but uh, the United States Postal Service is now say, saying it takes 10 days each way for first class mail. Um, so the deadline for ordering absentee ballots in our state is July 30th. Uh, and if you order it on July 30th, it might get to you on time, maybe by like August, fourth august 5th maybe um but then remember you have to mail it back or you could pay to overnight it from your house to the election commission because they can receive it that way um i am saying at this point that if you haven't uh, requested an absentee ballot by now um it's almost too late even though the deadline is july 30th you should be urging everyone to be, if they're going to be voting absentee, they need to get their application in right away. When you, uh, if you don't get your ballot, you might say, well, gosh, I'll just go to the polls and I'll vote on the machines. You can do that, but they're not gonna let you vote on the machines. They're going to make you vote provisionally. Next slide. And most provisional ballots in Tennessee are not counted. So 23% of the provisional ballots are counted. Um, so I, I would never vote provisionally unless it was the last resort. Next slide. The Secretary of State is even warning that it is a felony for anyone to share what is on their own website, which is a link to the absentee ballots, which is 
really amazing. Um, you can link to the Secretary of State, State's website, but they cite this law as a class A felony if you link to the part of the website that actually has the absentee ballot application. Now, just to give perspective as to what some other states are doing, you know, we have to apply for an absentee ballot. In some states, they're just sending absentee ballots to every eligible voter. They're just assuming y'all don't want to come to the polls and we don't want you here. So everybody gets an absentee ballot or they're sending everybody applications for absentee ballots. Um, but not in our state. You have to apply. I cannot link the absentee ballot uh, application to my Twitter account or Jim Cooper can't post it on his website because that's considered by our state law to be a, uh, a felony. Uh, okay, next slide. And then we've just learned, thanks to Joel Ebert's reporting in the Tennessee, and I see David Plossus is on the um, line, and um, the Tennessean has done an incredible job covering um, voting and voter suppression in our state. But it turns out nursing home residents aren't going to be able to vote absentee at all. There are a class of citizens that will not be able to vote absentee. And why, you might ask? Well, because our Secretary of State is so worried that if nursing home residents get absentee ballots, then um, they'll be taken advantage of and people might collect all the ballots and like fill them out for residents and send them in. So for years, the law in Tennessee has been no absentee ballots in nursing homes. The election personnel will go in to those nursing homes and register them then. Well, what happens in the era of COVID when no one's going into nursing homes? That means that nursing home residents are not going to be able to vote absentee. The only exception is if you are a nursing home resident and you lit, are in that nursing home in a, in a county where you're not registered, then you can get an absentee ballot. But you're already in a nursing home. You're already very susceptible to COVID. And now your right to vote has been taken away. Next slide. Uh, and of course, some first time voters, um, which I think this might have what got the attention of Brightheart uh, uh, originally to invite me to come on here, is that uh, remember that college student problem where you can't vote absentee the first time unless you vote on the machines? Well, that applies to everybody now. So if you are a person who has, is voting for the first time in Tennessee, if you just moved to Tennessee, or if you just moved to your Tennessee county from one county to another county, or if you're a naturalized citizen, um, and this will be their, your first time to vote. You can ask for an absentee ballot, but you won't get one because you haven't voted on the machines the first time. So you have to, next slide, you have to, uh, yeah, next slide, this was a story about that. Um, here you go. You can very inconveniently get in your car in Nashville and drive all the way to the election commission office, which is right out next door to the uh, Nashville International Airport and you can walk in and show your ID and then they'll let you get an absentee ballot. Next slide. Uh, we just get national headlines for all the wrong reasons. This was um, uh, in the Washington Post about our first time voters. Uh, next slide. Um, and this is not new. Um, this is my um, dear friend, Charlene Oliver, who heads up the very important Equity Alliance in Tennessee, who's, um, whose mission is to register black voters um, in uh, Memphis in 2018. Next slide. Um, they registered 90,000 African Americans to uh, vote through the Black Voter Project in their efforts with Equity Alliance. And the elections officials in Memphis um, said, hey, we can't possibly process all these new voters because the voter registrations were submitted so close to the deadline. What? They were within the deadline, but oh, it was so close, there were so many, we're not gonna be able to process them. Well, a judge stepped in and, and made them process them, um, and then also made them pull out of the garbage cans, the, one they, the ones they had thrown away, because people hadn't checked the salutation box at the top, which is the Mr., Mrs., Ms. Um, in Shelby County, that was considered an incomplete um, voter um, application. Um, which is, of course, not required by state law, but it's on the application. They hadn't filled it out. Who fills that out? 
Next slide. Uh, so in, um, in uh, retaliation for what uh, the Equity Alliance was able, able to do with the support of the Black Voter Project, um, the legislature passed a bill to punish voter registration groups. If you had too many incomplete registrations, like not checking the salutation box, um, that you could be charged with uh, criminal penalties and fines. Um, a, a, a federal judge, Elena Trauger, stepped in. There was a hearing scheduled for this next January, um, conveniently getting past the 2020 election. Um, and the legislature, right before they adjourned because of COVID in March, they repealed the law. They realized it was a loser. Um, next slide. So these are just some headlines um, about voter suppression, um, efforts to criminalize voting around the state. Um, some of these things are, um, you know, our local media, some are national. Um, next slide. Um, as I mentioned, there's two court cases pending now. We'll see what happens for November. Um, next slide. Uh, there was a disaster in Georgia. You may have seen Fulton County, um, Atlanta was the center of the problems. It's the county with the largest population of black voters. The lines were seven hours long. Um, next slide. More lines in Georgia called a catastrophe, um, particularly in minority areas. Um, next slide. Uh, the devil went down to Georgia, but he moonlights in Tennessee for sure. And this is what we can expect in our elections. Next slide. If you're still not convinced, um, there is a plan in place and it's very well funded by the GOP for November. Next slide. They're uh, investing $20 million to hire 50,000 people to uh, stand and serve as poll watchers. Um, at the polls. And I can tell you because I've worked as a voter protection um, worker every election is we get calls um, on election day from people who have, for example, worn the hijab into their voting um, location or their last name is Garcia. And they are challenged at their polling place as somebody who definitely doesn't live here and clearly is trying to um, uh, vote when they shouldn't be. Um, and these, this is exactly what this is. This is hiring people to go and intimidate voters that they don't think should be voting at that particular precinct or that part of town. Um, next slide. Um, I just thought this one was kind of funny. Um, Jose Andres is showing up with food and drinks at election locations. Um, this is kind of how bad and dire the situation could be. Um, next slide. Um, and it's not just progressives that are saying this. This is just from uh, last week's Washington Post, the conservative Washington Post columnist um, George Will quoted a scholar at the conservative Hoover Institution who said, next slide, uh, the hard truth is that there has been a rising tide of voter suppression in recent U.S. elections. These actions have the appearance of enforcing abstract principles of electoral integrity, but the clear effect and apparent intent of disproportionately disenfranchising racial minorities. Next slide. So what gives me hope? Next slide. Uh, the, those long lines in Georgia, three times as many people turned out, uh, even standing in line for seven hours. Next slide. And I believe that Tennesseans, if they have the right information, they are gonna vote no matter what. I feel that energy right now in our state. Next slide. Um, what we can do, we can vote early. Remember that uh, relative advantage, 14 days of early vote over a three week period. We should vote right now. <laughs> Next slide. Um, and just to give you some perspective, the biggest vote we ever had in Davidson County was in 2008 when Barack Obama was on the ballot. 72% of the total vote was cast during early vote, which had never been the case before, hasn't been the case since. Um, this was a record. This is what we need to be doing for 2020. Um, and there's a campaign that is going to be rolled out over the next several weeks um, to try to get to 80% or higher. Um, in the November election. Um, next slide. And uh, Breitart is already interested in being a part of this and promoting this effort to get people to the polls early. Um, next slide. And um, you can vote for legislators who vote to make it easier for citizens to vote. 
um, that's, you know, could be a criteria of yours. Um, there aren't, there are not that many on, on the Republican side. I can say that the Democratic legislators are united in um, our state to try to fix these things. Um, and they're really outnumbered. And you can support organizations that are dedicated to advancing our voting rights and our democracy, like Brightheart, like um, the Equity Alliance, um, like the ACLU of Tennessee. And, and others, but those are um, principally ones that are extremely involved and effective in this effort. Um, next slide. And finally, the other thing that gives me hope is, you know, we did at one point <laughs> elect this man to office um, and we have to do everything we can um, to make sure our vote counts. So that's the end of the slides. I think I went a few minutes over too. Sorry about that, Chase. That's okay. Thank you so much, Lisa. As all of you who have perhaps not heard Lisa speak before or read some of her uh, pieces. Uh, she's our state's leading expert on this topic and we're so delighted to have the opportunity to have you here with us to explore this threat to our democracy that, that voter suppression clearly represents.